Hey, it's Mark Ferguson with Investor More, and I have dealt with a lot of wholesalers over the years, and many of my worst nightmares with properties have come from wholesalers. But we've also bought some really good properties and made a lot of money from using wholesalers as well. So I wouldn't keep buying properties from wholesalers if there wasn't a reason for it, but there are many things you need to watch out for and be careful buying from wholesalers as well. So what you're looking at right now is a house flip we bought a few years ago. It was a hoarder house, absolutely awful. Absolutely awful human beings owned the house and we had to evict them. They basically left animals there while they moved out and it was just a crazy situation. We'll talk a little bit about that, but I wanna go over some of the major things to watch out for when buying properties from wholesalers. And this is actually the house after we cleaned it up a bit. We'll show you what it looked like before we cleaned it up, if you can believe that. So when you buy a house from a wholesaler, we'll talk about that first, basically what you're doing is you're buying from somebody who found a deal, never put any money into it themselves, and are selling it trying to make a profit. And I have no problem with that. They put work into it. They have to work very hard to find these deals. Good wholesalers can be very valuable, but there are many wholesalers who have no idea what they're doing and can cause a lot of problems as well. So if I'm a wholesaler, I might drive around looking for dilapidated houses. I might send postcards out to people who are absentee owners. There's lots of different ways I can try and find deals. Then I have to contact those people, um, look at the house, tell them my deal and say, hey, um, I'd like to buy this, get this under contract. So if the wholesaler can come up with the price, they get it under contract, then they try to assign that contract to an investor like me who will flip houses and take a fee for doing it. Now a wholesaler cannot just bring a buyer and seller together because that would be acting as a real estate agent without a license. So if they sell a contract, it's usually legal depending on what state you're in. I know Ohio has tried to crack down on even that. Sometimes wholesalers will also do a double close, which is where they will get the contract signed and the day of closing, they will actually buy the property using funds from the investor like me. So I deposit my money on closing day, the wholesaler buys a house from the seller that same day, uses my money to buy it, then immediately sells it back to me and they pocket the difference between what the original seller is selling it and what I end up buying it for. So it's kind of confusing, but that's basically how wholesalers work. I've worked with many, many different wholesalers, some brand new, some who have been in the business for years and years and years. I prefer to work with the ones who have been in business for years and years and years because they know what they're doing. They're often more upfront, more honest, and there's less problems that can come around. However, the company I bought this house from had been in business for years and years and years and was the complete opposite of that. And that was New Western. Um, and they used a company called Tiago uh, or Tiago Title in Denver, which completely screwed me over on this deal. That's mouse poop, if you're wondering. Um, so how do, did they mess up this deal? Well, one, um, they showed us the house. And one thing you have to watch out for with wholesalers, and not all do this, but this is a big company, they add on as many fees as they possibly can at closing. They don't always disclose them, don't always tell you them up front. They tried to add on a marketing fee, which meant they wanted to charge me for all the marketing they did to find this seller. Postcards, et cetera, is like a couple thousand dollars. There was like a processing fee. There was a buyer acquisition fee. They tried to charge me like $7,000 in extra fees that they never told me about when I bought this. So I'm like, nope, I'm not doing that. And we talked about it and they removed those fees after some discussions. Um, also, when you're buying a wholesale deal, it's usually more expensive than buying a regular property that's listed on the MLS with a real estate agent, because typically the seller will pay for title insurance, some of the other costs, closing fees. Well, a wholesaler doesn't want to have any of their own money in the deal. So they usually will not pay for title insurance, any of the closing fees, any of that. They will have the buyer pay all of those fees. So you might have a couple extra thousand dollars or more, depending on the state you live in, when you buy a wholesale deal because you're paying for all those fees instead of the seller who often pays for those fees. Now, something else, if you happen to be a real estate agent or you're using a real estate agent, now there's a lot of news lately about NAR and the Department of Justice and lawsuits and how commissions work. Well, 
in the past, <laughs> sellers uh, could easily pay for the buyer's agent, right? It comes from their proceeds. I know I might even not, I'm not even supposed to say that, which is crazy, but it, from the seller's proceeds, the buyer's agent is often paid. So if you're buying a house for 220,000, you know your buyer's agent is probably getting paid from that 220,000. You don't have to pay anything extra. That may change soon. Buyers may now have to pay extra. Well, in a wholesale deal, if you've got an agent who's helping you and you want to buy a wholesale deal, you've got to add that onto the price, right? The, the, the wholesaler's not paying any you know, commissions at all. Um, if you've got a buyer's agent, you've got to bump that price up to whatever it might be to pay for that agent. So that's just another cost you might have. Me as a, a broker and agent, I often buy houses from the MLS. So if I buy one from the MLS, I know I'm probably going to make a commission as the buyer's agent. But um, if I'm buying from a wholesaler deal, I know I'm not going to get that commission, so I have to add that cost on to it as well. So it is expensive, more expensive to buy wholesale properties at the same price than properties from the MLS for most people, and especially for agent investors like myself. But really how I got messed up on this deal is for a number of reasons, and I could have done some more things to um, make sure this didn't happen, but there's some things that were out of my control as well. One, this property was supposed to be delivered to me vacant. So we'll talk more about that too with some other post-occupancy agreements. So they said this house will be vacant because a lot of times with wholesalers, they'll have post-occupancy agreements that sellers are allowed to stay. There's all kinds of weird stuff going on. But this was supposed to be vacant. And I think I was on vacation or maybe I was there on, or maybe I was on vacation when this deal was done. But what happened was I drove by the property it sure looked like it wasn't vacant. I asked the wholesaler, I'm like, hey, is this property vacant? I'm not closing on it until it is. They said, let me double check. It's supposed to be vacant. They called back and said, no, they need a day or two more to move out, um, but it will be vacant, don't worry. So I'm like, all right, we're extending closing. You said it would be vacant. I'm not gonna buy it until it's vacant. So the next day or two days later, he's like, okay, it's vacant, you're good to go. I drive by, there's a moving van in the driveway. That's a good sign, right? And this is back when the eviction was happening and you can see how disgusting the house was then. So I'm like, okay, they're moving vans in there. Are they moving out? He's like, he'll be out today. Don't worry about it. So I'm like, can I get inside the house? And like, well, they're dropping keys off at the, the closing table. So we'll get them to you then. I'm like, all right. So we end up closing on it. Um, I didn't get keys, which is a huge red flag and I shouldn't have bought it. But I was like, I saw the moving van. I'm pretty sure they're out. It should be okay. Well, they didn't move out. Well, technically, the people moved out. They left all their animals here. They left dogs, cats here, and apparently they would come back every week or so to give them food. So this is what the house looked like when we finally got possession. What happened was we scheduled an eviction because there are animals there. We can't just kick the animals out. There was so much stuff. Um, once the eviction day came, animal control, um, animal control was there. The animals were still there. The people did not come get them. They knew when the eviction was, they left their animals there. So the police said, we don't want to take the animals, call them up. They were able to call them. The people said, okay, fine, we'll come get our animals. So we rescheduled eviction for the next day. The people did come get their animals. We did the eviction, had to move all this stuff outside. It was 101 degrees that day. The house was full of feces and disgustingness. Um, I think three of my contractors probably wanted nothing to do with me for the rest of their lives after this um but we got it done and they luckily nobody quit there may have been a few people gagging and, and worse outside though i did help on this one too i was there and, and um i don't just always film i do help but this was not a fun one also we found a dead snake probably an eight foot long dead snake with a dead rat in the cage still at this property too but this isn't all there was more issues with this property and that was from the title company, Tiago Title. And what happened was after we bought it, they gave us clear title, said everything was good. Well, an un or a lien showed up for $5,000 for yard cleanup from the city. And you would think, you know, you get title insurance, you pay for title insurance, that that covers things like that, liens and different things. It's supposed to give you clear title. Well, this lien was not recorded till after closing. And the title company said, it's not our problem. You deal with it pretty much. And I said, what are you talking about? Your title company, I paid for title insurance. I'm like, yeah, it was unrecorded. So there's no way we could know about it. So we're not going to do anything. And I talked to other title companies around the area. And this title company was in Denver. We were in Greeley. And the other title company said, well, it is unrecorded, but anybody who works around Greeley 
knows that they take about six to eight months to record their liens and you call them on every single sale to say, hey, are there un any unrecorded liens against this property? Because a lot of times there are. So every local title company would know that, but this title company did not know that because they weren't local. And that's a lot of times what you see with wholesalers as well is they work a large area. They don't use local title companies. They might not know all the ins and outs of what's happening locally. Buyers are allowed to use their own title company though. I could have used my own title company and I would have had to pay for them too. Thinking back on it, yes, I should have just used my own title company. But a lot of times the wholesalers will say, well, you have to use mine. That's how we're doing this deal. Even though technically I don't think they can say that. Um, I might have had to pay for two title companies actually now that I think about it because I was paying for their title company and if I brought my own title company in, I'd have to pay for them as well. So it would have been a lot of extra cost if I had done that. Here's a crazy turtle pit, we think, in the backyard with a cement diving board. Maybe not a diving board, sidewalk, but anyway. So we went through this whole fiasco with Tiago Title, with New Western, about this money, why I was, why I was having to pay for it. And um, they said, well, we'll try and get the seller to pay for it. I was like, what are you talking? And they're like, well, we can't find the seller. They're in Texas somewhere. They won't pay for it. But this was a double close. I bought this property from New Western. The seller was New Western. And I told the title company that. I'm like, what are you talking about? The seller's New Western. They're the ones who sold it to me. Your documents say New Western, not this other person. And then Tiago Title went on a social media terror, just talking crap about me everywhere they could, leaving bad reviews for me everywhere they could. It was crazy. So of course I did likewise and left bad reviews for them, except mine were valid because of what happened. Theirs were completely unfounded. So I posted on my YouTube channel, all kinds of stuff. And eventually New Western paid me directly outside of Tiago because Tiago wouldn't do anything. And I don't know if I'm saying Tiago or Tiago right, but I'm just saying both of them eventually. <laughs> one of them's got to be right. So that is some of the crazy stuff you have to deal with. With wholesalers is one. Title companies can be very different. Not always, you know, doing the things you might used to, might not be used to with paying liens. There can be way more extra fees. There can be occupancy issues and um, other problems too. But there's more, don't worry. This is another wholesale deal I bought from, and you might recognize this video or from another video I just recently did about how to get rid of squatters because we've had lots of squatter issues too, which often come from wholesalers. But this house I got in a contract from a wholesaler and it was a, another larger national company and there were multiple people who wanted this deal. So a lot of times when you, you, vis you view a wholesale property, they give you a time for when it can be viewed and you're there with other investors. There might be one, two, five, ten other investors looking at this property at the same time. So it can be very confusing about how they're going to accept an offer if multiple people, multiple people want it. Sometimes the wholesalers are just like, okay, whoever tells me first gets it. Sometimes the wholesalers will have an online bidding system and say, okay, submit your best bid. We'll take the highest one. Or sometimes they play a card game like they did in this one. Basically, there are three of us who wanted it. The wholesaler had a deck of cards. And he said, whoever picks the highest card gets the house. And so I think the first person picked a three. Um, the second person picked a queen. And I ended up picking a king. And I won. I thought I wasn't going to get it. I don't know if I was, that was a good thing or a bad thing. But what happened, this is after the eviction, because we had to evict this, these people as well. Um, there was a $5,000 post-occupancy agreement for the seller. So we see this all the time with wholesalers. Always ask wholesalers if there's a post-occupancy agreement. A lot of times people are selling houses as a wholesale deal because there's something wrong and they don't want to sell it as a normal MLS deal. They don't want to move. They've got tons of stuff they're not going to take. Um, there's problems they don't want to disclose with the house. There's all kinds of reasons they're wholesaling it as opposed to listing it on the MLS. It's not just because this wholesaler came along and is trying to scam them. A lot of times there's bigger reasons why sellers do this. So this seller would not talk to us, would not respond to us. And after two weeks, which was how long their post-occupancy agreement was, was still living in the property, had made zero effort to move. So after the two weeks, they lost their $5,000. That's how these post-occupancy agreements work. But sometimes you will find wholesalers who will not have any money for a post-occupancy agreement or like $100 a day or a couple thousand dollars. And honestly, 5,000 is not enough. If you're doing a post-occupancy agreement, you should be holding back at least $10,000 and try to make it payable as soon as they are not out and past their one day they're supposed to be out so um in this case five thousand was just not enough for them to want to leave 
And it also was happening right during COVID or after COVID. So I think they thought maybe they could just stay here for like six months or a year because of the eviction laws. But we got around that because we evicted them for being a seller, not for late rent. So surprise on them. But that is something you have to really be careful with with wholesalers are post occupancy agreements, how they're set up, how they're written, um, and if the title company will accept them. Because we had another post occupancy agreement, the Hoarder House, where it was paying $250 a day. We had 5000 set back. The seller went past that. Um, the three weeks they had, then we're losing $250 a day. There's an argument at the end about, well, he moved out on this day. I'm like, no, I have video of you still being there. We could never come up with an agreement. A year passed, and eventually the title company who was holding the escrow money gave it back to me because the agreement said, if we can't come to an agreement after a year, I get it. Again, I don't think the seller knew that, and honestly, I didn't even know that either. <laughs> that is a nice surprise when they said, hey, we're going to give you this full $5,000 now. Took a year, but we got it. But be very careful with post-occupancy agreements. Be very careful with vacant properties. All of that when you're buying wholesale deals because it can leave yourself in a mess like this. So another thing, a lot of times wholesale deals come with all kinds of stuff. They aren't cleaning the house. They aren't taking stuff with them. So realize you're not going to get a nice clean house like you probably will with the MLS. And um, you might get a lot of different surprises in that property. Don't worry. We're still this is another wholesale deal I bought. And this one was very interesting because I bought it without seeing the inside. So that is something else you will see with wholesalers sometimes as well. Sometimes you can't get access right away. Sometimes they offer access one day. And if you're not available, you can't get in there. But you know it's still a good deal. You still want to buy it. On this particular one, the wholesaler had talked to me and said, Hey, I've got this deal. Um, I've got like four people interested in it. But I can't get out there for two weeks to show it. I want to sell it before that. He's like, can you go peek in the windows? And if you want it, I'll give you a good deal. So I did. I peeked in the windows. I looked inside. It didn't have a basement, so that made it easier. And it didn't look horrible. It was a good price. I bought it. This one actually worked out. There weren't any major issues. Um, it kind of looked how it looked from the outside on the inside, except for those weird like cement block things that were there. Um, but that is something to be aware sometimes you can't see these houses or you have like five minutes to view them is very quick it's in and out so you have to be prepared to act very quickly if you want these deals and then know what you're looking for have some experience to see hey here's what the windows look like the hvac might be bad the roof might be bad it needs flooring it needs a kitchen uh, is the plumber gal is the plumbing galvanized is the electrical knob and tube there's all types of things you have to try and look at and see in a very short period of time and there's no inspection on almost all wholesale deals so i can't go in there with my inspector after i say i'm going to buy this house and say oh i found all this stuff i want ten thousand off or i don't want this deal it's a take it or leave it you don't get an inspection if you like it you buy it if you find out that something is majorly wrong after you get it under contract you lose your earnest money oftentimes your earnest money is five or ten thousand dollars it's much higher than a normal deal and um, there's a lot more risk coming into these properties. So you've really got to know your stuff. This is why it's so hard for, um, you know, owner occupants to buy wholesale deals. And, you know, you probably aren't able to get an appraisal done. If there are any appraisal conditions and they do let you do an appraisal, they're not going to fix them. So there's tons of differences that come with these wholesale deals. And it's not like you can just come in there, buy it like a regular house, have a showing, do your inspection, do an appraisal, ask for repairs, ask for inspection repairs, um, negotiate. It is much, much different. And for those reasons too, you might need cash, private money, hard money to buy these properties. So like I said, this one didn't go that bad. And like I said before, many wholesale deals we've bought have been fine. They've worked out great. But um, there are some issues we've come up with some others as well. Don't worry. All right, here's another wholesale deal. Many of you might remember the church house. This used to be a church. It was converted to a house. And um, we worked on this one for a long time. Uh, had so tons of issues. The major one being getting a new electrical service to the house. And Excel, our power company, takes forever to do that. Like literally months and months and months and months. But this brings up disclosure issues on wholesale houses. Now, technically, not every state requires you to fill out a property disclosure. A property disclosure is something a seller fills out, says everything they know about the house, if there's any material defects, if it floods, if there's problems, etc. You're supposed to tell 
anyone looking at the house or buying the house of anything wrong with it that you know about pretty much. Well, you don't have to fill out a property disclosure in Colorado or a lot of states, but just because you don't fill out a property disclosure does not mean you don't have to disclose material facts. And material facts are basically, it's kind of, you know, wishy-washy, but if there's an issue that would greatly affect the value of a home, you have to tell the, the buyer about it. Whether you do a disclosure or not, whether you lived in the house or not, if you know of a major problem in the house that would greatly impact its value, you have to disclose it to the new buyers. Well, a lot of times, I feel like people sell their house to wholesalers because they know of major problems with the properties and they don't want to disclose them because they know their agent's going to make them do it, the MLS is going to make them do it, they're signing a contract, they'll be you know, much easier to hold repercussions against them if they do that. So they sell it to this wholesaler and maybe they tell them issues, maybe they don't, they should, they're still legally obligated to tell the wholesaler and then the wholesaler sells it to me or signs a contract to me or another investor and if they sign the contract, the seller still is obligated to disclose any material facts, but they often don't. And if they're doing a double close and the wholesaler knows about any material facts, they should be disclosing them too. Sometimes they do, a lot of times they don't. Now on this house, someone was murdered in this house a year before I bought it. It was not disclosed to me. I found out about it at closings. The title company heard about it. I still bought it. And technically that was okay because in Colorado, you're not required to disclose murders or deaths or anything like that. However, in other states you are. Now, if there had been a major you know, foundation problem and the seller knew about it and didn't tell me, they would have been required to disclose that if they didn't. Technically, I could go sue them, but it gets wishy-washy with wholesale deals. So the point of this video is that while they didn't really technically do anything wrong, when you're buying from a regular seller on the MLS, they're probably gonna disclose a lot of things to try and keep themselves out of hot water. It's probably smart to disclose, you know, if there was a murder or a death in here, even if it's not required, you know, that's up for your attorney, you decide, whatever. But when you're buying a wholesale deal, almost nothing is disclosed to you. It's basically up to you to figure out what's wrong, what's not wrong, you're not getting inspection. So you basically have to plan for the worst. So remember, if you see other investors who you think are paying crazy prices and aren't thinking about this stuff, maybe they're newer, it doesn't mean you have to. Just because it's a wholesale deal doesn't mean it's a good deal. A lot of times I turn down wholesale deals, I won't buy them. A lot of times I'll even negotiate on wholesale deals and try and get them lower. But I'm not there trying to buy every single wholesale deal because there can be so many issues with them, so many more costs with them. And a lot of times I'm buying from new wholesalers who have no idea what they're doing. And that brings up something else, right? Just because a wholesaler presents you a contract, just because they tell you some things does not mean what they're doing is legal, does not mean they have any clue what they're doing. They may have taken a three-day wholesaler class and not listened to a word of it and gotten this wholesale contract from online, not filled it out right. So if you have no experience with real estate deals and you get a wholesale contract, have an attorney review it, have a professional review it, um, have a title company review it, get somebody to look at it, tell you if it's legit, if it's gonna cause any problems. Um, there's a reason why real estate contracts are 17, 18 pages in most states because they cover so many different things, so many different issues that can come up. And a lot of times you'll see a wholesale contract that's one page or two pages and it leaves out everything. So you have to be very careful with that side of it. Um, a lot of times, you know, wholesalers forget things about earnest money, about how stuff works. It just, they just don't know. And me doing this for years and years will actually help them do this deal and walk them through it. A regular person or someone who's never done a wholesale deal might get themselves in a heap of trouble um, going through that. Something else, as a real estate investor, I have to be, sorry, as a real estate investor and real estate agent, I have to be very careful too, because I am held to a higher standard for ethics and disclosures and all that stuff. So just because I am getting a contract from a wholesaler, let's say they assign it to me, right? I am becoming the buyer on that contract. Whatever the wholesaler agreed to and wrote up and did, I am now responsible for in that contract because it was assigned to me. If they did something wrong or illegal, I am now a party to that contract that's wrong or illegal, so I have to make sure it's all done correctly and right. There's also multiple disclosures you have to fill out in Colorado, square footage disclosure, um, smart to do a mold disclosure, uh, you know, uh, other, some buyer's agency stuff. There's all kinds of different stuff that should be filled out when you're a broker or an agent. On these wholesale deals, 
you get nothing, right? It's just a one-page contract. So even though we're assigning the, the deal or, or doing a double close and it's not us who first, you know, procured this the sale, we're still responsible for it. So we will still go through, do all the disclosures the seller's supposed to do, all that paperwork on our end. We will sign it. We will send it to them to sign. Sometimes they sign it, sometimes they don't. But as long as we're making an effort to get them to sign it, to have this document kind of do their job for them a little bit, we should be clear on our end. Lead-based paint disclosures, things like that should all be done. Um, even if you're not the one you know, who found the sellers and are listing the property, you've still got to be careful on that side of it. So if you're a real estate agent, you especially have to be more careful with these wholesale deals and make sure everything's being done correctly. So I'm sure there's many things I missed, but those give you a few ideas, a few things to watch out for with wholesale deals. This is also why a lot of buyers who aren't experienced, who aren't real estate agents, will bring on agents to help them on a wholesale deal and pay them or have the price increased to pay their agents because agents should know, not all, but most should know about disclosures, what to watch out for, different things to look for on these wholesale deals. I can get a lot of you know, really cheap properties doing these deals. We've made a lot of money on these deals, but we've also lost some money and had some nightmares because of the different situations I described. Luckily, I have a YouTube channel and social media where I can kind of capitalize a little bit on the crazy stuff that happens to me, and it's not all lost money. <laughs> Most people don't have that either, so don't count on that, because um, that's a lot of work and a lot of time to build all that up. If you have questions, comments about wholesalers, dealing with them, um, please drop them below. And uh, I do have some courses and some different stuff on how to become you know, a wholesaler, find deals, do some different things like that as well, and be an investor, buying properties and buying from wholesalers. So you can check those out on investformore.com. And like I said, you can get some great deals, but there's also a lot of risk when you're buying from wholesalers. Thanks for watching. We'll be back soon with many more of our properties we're buying now, commercial properties, laundromats, liquor stores, all that, and of course, our continued crazy stories.